my name is Elif Deim. I live in Amsterdam. I'm 27 years old and I make R&B music, mostly alternative. And yeah, that's why I'm in a nutshell. So I'm curious, like, how did you get into R&B? It's not like something you randomly get into. I guess not. I think most people, most artists that go into R&B music, go into R&B music because they are raised on it. And also because it's kind of the modern representation of a lot of different, how do you say, like intertwined genres. I think R&B really allows a lot of different genres to meet. And ever since I was little, I listened to so many different genres. And for me, R&B would make the most sense to pursue. I mean, I listened to Mariah Carey and Khalees and Beyonce and Lauryn Hill when I was younger, <clears throat> but also a lot of hip hop and a lot of disco. So yeah, for me, what makes R&B R&B is the style of singing. And I think how I learned to sing was by listening to R&B singers. So basically I could make any other genre, but the the way I sing would still make it R&B. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a feeling. I mean, when it comes to R&B, there's that emotion that comes out of it that just feels so like soulful and just yeah. to the heart. So I always love asking oh, why someone would go into the R&B realm when, you know, you got pop and disco and you got EDM and everything. So it's always a fun take to hear. I, I think that's well said. For me, it's also about the emotion that I get to put in singing. Like, it's a very sensitive type of singing, like, very heartfelt. Like, every little run, every little thing comes with a feeling, I think. And even though I love pop music, for me, it's too straight. Like, a little bit too flat, vocally. I get that. That's, that's a good take. Um, and with that being said, you know, this album that came out, um, Secretly Detached, it is filled with so much soul and experimental tones that I'm so curious to like get your thoughts on it in general. How did the title come to be? Thank you. Um, the title, so I've been in a lot of uh, therapy over the years. I started when I was eight years old and I've just this year I've seen the other end of it and of course in therapy you learn a lot about different attachment styles about I mean a myriad of things of course but one of the things that stood out to me is like attachment styles and you have securely attached uh, in, in which you grow up in a pretty safe environment you know how to uh, safely attach to people because they don't just disappear up out of your life and it's just a safe safe way of growing up that allows you to also emotionally be safe and uh, in your relationships and then you have anxiously attached of course um, which is the opposite so you're very scared to commit um, you're also very scared of being left and it's just a very anxious way of having um, relationships. And I always like to kind of play around with the words and have sort of a dichotomous element to everything I sing about because I I don't think my music sounds really sad, um, but when you uh, read what I'm singing, <clears throat> it gets more of a sad uh, edge, but I don't ever want um, shedding light on mental issues to become a depressing thing. So I kind of like the dichotomy of happy having happy sounding music with a more poignant uh, message. And um, how do I explain this well? So I come from a family where we're greatly codependent. Like we have a lot of addiction issues and a lot of trauma, which all makes us very like, anxious, very concerned with each other and very codependent. Um, and when I first moved out of the house, 
I had so much difficulty with all this time I suddenly had on my hands to kind of worry about myself. Um, so it took me a long time to feel safe in being detached from my codependent relationships. And that's kind of where the term securely detached eventually came from. So that I felt really good in finally stepping out of that dynamic with my family. And it was also like a little bit, um, how do you say? Like it's not the final word on it. And that's also what the, the uh, title track kind of brings across is that when you try to get better, it doesn't happen in a day and you never really get better. It's a daily process. And um, in like the 12 step recovery programs that, that I learned a lot about uh, due to my family's issues, they say uh, perfect, don't progress. Uh, no, you say progress, progress, progression, not perfection. And that's kind of how I try to live. So that's, I think that would sum it up basically how securely detached came into my mind. Wow. Yeah. Love that. And, you know, therapy is a fantastic tool to help guide you into a much better person in the end. And to then be able to reflect about this into your album is insane. Like, I love the progress that you've made so far and to Thank you. create this kind of album with such dynamics in that I it's it's Thank amazing you. um Thank you. what one of the things I've noticed is that you know you may have mentioned uh, you mentioned earlier about your parents I love that you had that little bit of a theme throughout the whole thing in forms of uh of your skits I'm I'm so fascinated on the idea of the skits how did that kind of like come to be well at first, I had uh, the project. I had a very strict idea about how many songs I wanted, um, the theme every song had to have. So it's for me it was a little bit, a little bit like writing a book and drawing the outline. So it needs to have these chapters. It's gonna start there, and the conclusion is gonna end there. So I had these eight songs finished at one point, and I was kind of struggling with finding the right order for them because like the order you see now is not the order in which the songs were made. I think actually Selexa, the first track of the project was the song we finished last. Um, oh, really? And even, yeah. And I know, I knew that uh, Selexa had to be like in the beginning, but still I couldn't really figure it out. And I wanted something that could kind of glue the storyline together. And um, I'm a huge uh, fan of Eminem and master ace <laughs> and they always did these really funny skits in between their songs that would kind of tell you more about the story so that's how i got the idea and also i think brent fires did it um kendrick has done it recently so i thought it would be nice to kind of bring it back and it's also i think it serves as a as a little bit of humor also I mean, especially the second skit, uh, Go Home, we died making this. It was so funny. Like, even though it's not really funny, we had so much fun, me and the producer. We were laughing our ass off. And that's important for me is to have fun and a little bit of jokes amidst all the heavy subject matter. So, yeah, like the skits, I think I'm going to keep doing it. It's really fun and more creative even than the music i think in some way no, I, so, I, yeah. I absolutely adore the skits i thought they were so fun and go home was hilarious i i was re-listen i re-listened to it uh right before the sh uh you came on and i was like oh i gotta i have to ask about this how many takes did you have to do for this one or is it just one take um i think i i the so the song you hear in the background um that's me so i said to my producer, like, I want to create a song, like a fake song, to put in this skit on the background. So that's what we did first. And um, I'm on the internet a lot. And you have this meme where they say, like, I want to go home. And I thought, like, oh, that's 
that's great. We can use that. So um, the producer, Benchy, he makes a lot of reggaeton. That's not my genre, but I thought, oh, it would be fun to kind of make a reggaeton song, a sounding song um, to use like for in the background. So it's just me going, I want to go home. That's just that. <laughs> and then I said, okay, let's have footsteps. And I was kind of humming along with the song. It was all one take. I think just for the the last bit where I walk into the room, I had to do it a couple of times because we were laughing. It was just, we had to do a lot of takes. <laughs> you know, now that you pieced it together with that meme, I was like, oh no, I have, I'm, I love it. I love that you did that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now the question is, are you going to release that later on, on a, on a random like TikTok post? The actual song, the little sound uh, sound bit that you did for the skit. Uh, good question. I actually wanted to make this song and release it after the project to have like mm, security detached deluxe with this song on it. But we'll see. Right, I'm not okay. sure yet. And <laughs> another problem. Oh, I'll get it sorted. But I've been locked out of my TikTok account. Oh, no. <laughs> so I cannot be doing anything on TikTok at the moment. Wait, what did you but do on your TikTok? I didn't do anything. I just deleted the app because I felt like I was on it too much. And <laughs> I have my account linked um, to Twitter. But Twitter is now X. So I think they have some problems with like verifying your account through Twitter. So I've been oh. without TikTok for uh, two weeks now. Oh, ooh, that's Not really harsh. actively trying to get into it because eh, I was addicted. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no that's a nice question and maybe like a part of me kind of wants to move on to something new because this project uh, was in a mix for a long time and also it was finished quite a while ago um so part of me wants to move on but maybe maybe one day I will be like yes let's make this go home song but I think it's also fine how it is so with that now. Means, so with that being said you know for something that's been pretty much done for a while why did you wait until now to release it um one big part of it was finances because I had to save up a lot of money in order to do all the stuff that I wanted so I wanted to make a music video that was a lot of money I wanted to do um some PR campaigns like everything is just very expensive so it took me a while to save all the money together to make the music video for instance um, to be able to pay for the mix master so time uh, money was the biggest thing but also I think I got scared because it was I was make I was working on it for so long it gets really scary to have to think about actually putting it into the world but sometimes um, the beast of jealousy gets me and I look at other artists doing what I'm doing and I get jealous and I had the same feeling like last last spring, summer, where I was looking at an artist. And I was like, I, why is she doing what I'm not doing? And then I thought, really, that's my own that's my own problem because now I just have to start doing something for myself again because it was three years, I think, since I last released something. So that kind of motivated me to just just do it. Just get it started. Yeah. Wow, I didn't, not so far in this conversation, I didn't realize I would relate to you so much until this point. Um, oh. It's it's hard seeing other people releasing their stuff and you're like, I'm not sure if mine's good enough. And the fact that you did it is impressive. The fact that you, you post, uh, you submitted the application, it's out to the universe and you know, I'm, I'm proud of you. <laughs> thank you thank you yeah I mean jealousy is something like I don't know if it's if it should be called jealousy because it's for me it's not often that I look at someone and I I say oh I don't want them to have what they have um and I want it instead it's usually like I wish I would be in the same place as you um but Nevertheless, I think jealousy is something we don't like to talk about because it's not a beautiful emotion, but I think it's very normal. And I try to 
shift it into something positive. Like whenever you get jealous or you get that feeling in your stomach, it means you're not doing for yourself what you're supposed to be doing. And it's just like a little nudge, like, okay, step into action for yourself. I think that's the best way to deal with it. So that's what I, that's what I did. I released the thing. Where um, you get your sound files from, especially in the song uh, "Natural uh, Nature of the Beast." Mm -hmm. There's a little Um, bit of conversation there that I was curious. oh yeah, the sound file from Nature of the Beast is from a YouTube video that I had searched for. I was trying to find someone in a talk about the um 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 hereditary element of addiction and of course there's so many videos on this but I just wanted a nice sound sounding voice and someone that could sort of summarize it really well so I found this video and then I took a part out of it That's so I don't cool. think he'll yeah yeah sometimes I think would he be okay with that but I don't think he's ever going to hear the song so I guess I guess it's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was from a YouTube video. Uh, do you mean like samples also? Uh, that was like the big thing. I was quite curious on yeah. where that sound file came from when I was here. And I was like, oh, that's something I need to mention. I wrote down on my little notes. Oh, yeah. Um, no, it's from a YouTube video. I could probably find it again. But I never I never really saved it. I was like, yeah, that's good. Take it. Take it. Yeah. What does he say again? Addiction. I don't even know. I forgot. Uh, that's <laughs> my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love that it, it did carry on to the um closing prayer. I think that's what it's called. The, uh, the last skit scene. Yeah, yeah. Closing yeah. prayer. I got it right. I don't know. For some reason, in my head, I was thinking closing something. Closing prayer. Very good. Yeah. Very good. You can tell you listened to the whole album. That's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> that's my uh, mission. Yeah, I have to. <laughs> Closing prayer is uh, me. It's me. Oh, yeah. um, and that is um, that is um, a piece of literature from the Codependence Anonymous uh, Fellowship that I like to read out. And I put like a, a voice filter over it to kind of emphasize that it's actually anonymous. I'm not saying I'm in Codependence Anonymous because it's anonymous. And um, yeah, so that's that's what that is. That is just me reading part of that loud yeah like i i love that um you were that you chose to pick that for the close uh, for the last skit i felt that was a great way to wrap up the album in a way and then leading into the last song which happens to be the title that's it paired up really nice thank you thank you i, I am curious um in the song um for uh, the self-care song one of my big things I wanted to ask you was, is what does self-care look like for you? Self-care for me um, in the basis was something I had to even learn. So um, cleaning my house, doing my dishes, uh, making sure I eat and sleep enough. So comes to down to my primary needs, actually, first of all. Um, because I think, so actually the, the album really started about my depression. Like I have a very, um, um, very hard to beat depression. I've had it since I was five and, um, I tried a lot of therapy. Like I said, I was in therapy when I was eight. Um, like I went through a lot of things trying to, um, heal from this depression but nothing really worked and I think I always it never really worked because I was always trying to cover it up with something else so that could be like hyper fixating on a celebrity um like when Michael Jackson died in 2009 I was like in a deep depression for two years and I told myself no it's because Michael Jackson died when actually I was just depressed and when I was 16 I got a really uh, bad eating disorder and in all these ways, I could get gain control over something that I was not able to control. So I kind of put it into something else. And 
like it was really on and off. So sometimes I would feel good for a year and then I would feel horrible for two years. Um, and I think once I got into music school, which was like my dream, I thought I really convinced myself like, okay, now I am better because I can, I get to do music and I feel, feel validated for being accepted into the school. And I really thought like, oh, I'm better. And I tried everything like not eating, eating, drinking, uh, working, obsession, like everything was just a means of trying to, to, to cope with my depression. Um, but then after a year or so of being into music school, I felt my depression creeping back in. And I was like, no, what can I do now? Nothing. Like I have tried everything. Um, so then I decided to get help again. And I kind of knew because my depression got really, really bad. And I kind of knew like, if I don't really tackle this now, I may not recover and I may not survive. So while I was waiting to um, get mental health care and um, I got medication to kind of bridge the period. So while I was doing that, I really had to, in the smallest details, try to improve my life because you cannot tackle depression when you haven't eaten or you haven't slept or you're not even doing like the basic things of taking care of yourself. Um, so that's what I had to learn. It's like, okay, first take care of that. Then we will move on to the next thing. So I think for me, the physical self-care part was the first step and then mental self-care. Oh, that's just so, so huge. Um, there's so many aspects of it. But I think for me, the big aspect was kind of taking distance where I needed to from some family members for a while so I could let my own thoughts exist. And yeah, so that's that was one part of it. Um, yeah, getting trying to get healthy boundaries and speaking up for yourself and also, which is a very big thing, is not repressing your feelings and really learning to feel. Mm. Because I think what actually is the cause of my depression is repression. Like years and years and years of repression. And when I when I um first admitted again, like, okay, I'm I'm not well there was days when I was just crying all day long, like all my grief from all the years was just pouring out of me. And that's when I thought like, this is causing my depression. There's so many uh, pain points that have not been looked at. So uh, yeah, a big part of self-care is trying to keep the outpour, like the sort of like when a feeling arises, try to get it out of your system as soon as possible, like write it down, talk about it, like, just to have like, um, keep it flowing sort of. So that's also maybe even the biggest, biggest part of it. So yeah, that was a long story. <laughs> but basically, no, no. don't repress your feelings. Try not to repress your feelings and eat well and keep your house clean. Because when you're depressed, it gets really easy to let your house like grow fungus on the plates. And, you know, it's not, it's not pretty. It's not nice. <laughs> so yeah. and that's it's well put yeah, it's Thank you. it's self-care is very important it's it's one of those situations where it's like if you don't do it then it's gonna take over and then it's either downhill or or worse and um I'm glad that you're able to like manage that and, yeah and we're in a much that's better true time. yeah that's true like it, it's it's if you don't do it for a day, the next day will be twice as hard to do it. That's basically what it is. Because it just keeps growing and building. And yeah, you need to implement it every day. I still struggle with it. But it's gotten easier. Yeah. So um, hopefully I'm going to make a little bit lighter tone to this. Um, At the end, um, I normally have like a couple of conversation cards. They're fun. 
Um, nice. I love fun. Me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so the first one I have is what would you do in your lifetime that no one else will ever do? Okay. All right, all right. Something that's completely in a different corner. <laughs> yes. Something that I have done in my life that probably no one else will ever do is step into a sea urchin and have one of the spines come out of the other end of my foot one year after the incident. That's probably something no one will ever do. <laughs> oh. Right? <laughs> what do you think? How did that happen? That a lot. Hmm? How did that happen? I just, well, I was on vacation um, in Bali. I was in Changu, which is like the surfer village. And ironically, the surfer village is also the village where you have like these horrible rock formations in the water, like on the beach, right where the regular swimmers go. So the tide is pretty heavy. So I went in for a swim and I realized like, imagine you have this beach and on both sides of the beach, you have these big rock formations, but the water is only like this far above it. But you don't see that. So yeah. here you could walk, but then the tide dragged me into the formations. So I was a little bit panicked. I was like, oh, I actually can't get out. So I tried to stand up. Another wave would come and crash me into the um, rocks. So it hurt because these rocks are sharp. They're very sharp. They're like, like like spike they had spikes like it really hurt so eventually after 10 minutes of struggling i got myself out of the water and my leg was all bloody so i thought okay that's probably the, the rocks you know ow but then i went to sit down and my friend who i was with said like oh i have a black spike in my foot i turn around my foot and like the whole bottom of my foot was like covered in spikes this is quite a story so brace yourself Oh my the thing is, <clears throat> these spikes, they are poisonous because it's like a living, living kind of organisms, even when they yeah. break. So when they break, they go into your flesh and they break like right at the top. So it's really hard to get them out in, in a normal situation. But these claws also dig themselves deeper into your skin. So the moment they're in your skin, they will, they will travel deeper into your skin. And they're poisonous. And I'm at the beach in Bali. What am I going to do? Well, along comes this handy dandy man with a beer bottle. He says, we need to kill the, the, the spikes, basically. We need to deactivate the poison. This was a moment. So he takes my foot and starts banging the bottle on the bottom of my foot. And mind you, when one spike goes into your flesh, your whole hand hurts. Like you feel the poison like rushing through your being so this man was slamming them slamming them and with his rusty knife he started cutting them out well this was torture um so i said you know what let's stop it he said yeah we've gotten most of them well there was still a lot left so i think for the next few weeks i, I kept walking on them but i was really bothered because i still still saw these spikes in my foot and also in my finger i cut it out myself i was like imagine like cutting your own flesh was less painful than having the spike in your hand. Like that's, that's how painful it is. Like, it's really weird. You wouldn't expect it, but it hurts. So I kept walking. And then eventually after two weeks, I ended up in another like doctor's office. They numbed my foot and they cut it out. Um, but still there was some left. And then, well, I returned to the Netherlands and a year later, I felt this bump like at the top of my foot. And I was like, what is that? And the bump kind of started to become like black. And I saw my skin become like more translucent. And I but I was like, oh no, it's a spike. So it had literally gone, like if this is your foot, these are your toes. It had gone in here and it came out the other end because it travels. Wow. So, yeah. No, yeah, I've never heard shit. anyone else tell that story. So maybe that's a good answer. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't heard that story. Oh, my God. That's yeah. insane. So wear um, shoes. If you ever go into water, <laughs> wear their sea urchins. You don't want to find yourself in this situation. Really, really careful. Like, I have, like, um, gosh, this was years ago. 
like it's been a decade ago I used to have like little tiny sea urchins in my like fish tank but you did yes yes little ones uh but never had an incident where they like I got poked by them so just to imagine yeah getting poked is insane I don't think you would really get poked I think like the thing that happened is I stepped on one and then they like shoot out their needles yeah it's like a defense and as an mechanism act of self-defense which I understand like I would do the same but Yeah, so you have to step on them with like a lot of force. I don't think if you would touch it that it would like stab you or something. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's that's a story PSA. that I can <laughs> Yeah. Wear water shoes. <laughs> wow. Um then I feel like this next question will kind of pretty much be that answer too. Um here, how about this one? What is a, a simple task that you were surprisingly bad at? A simple task that I was surprising, I am surprisingly bad at watering my plants. I feel like everybody's really bad at watering their plants. Yeah, I think there's a lot of simple acts that I'm really bad at, like doing my dishes, watering my plants, vacuuming, <laughs> vacuuming my carpet. A lot, a lot. What's yours? Ooh, I am really bad at waking up on time. Um, That's a good one. yeah. That's a good one. You know, I'm not, I may, I may not be that person that has like seven different alarms on their phone for every 30 minutes, but I am that person who has at least two where I'm like, the, it's the, oh shit, it's time to wake up and the, oh shit, you're late for work. <laughs> Yeah. there's, Yeah. there's only two alarm clocks. And if one hits, I have like a little bit of time, but then when the other one hits, I'm done. I have to quickly get out. There's no in between. There's Are no you a bright snoozer? place. <laughs> What's that? Are, are you a snoozer? I am. I am. Yeah, me too. But Me it's too. weird. I think I'm that's also our downfall. a morning. It's weird because, like, I'm also a morning person. Like, I'm a morning person and a night person. Like, the midday can't stand. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm a, I swear, I'm like, I'm part vampire or cat. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a morning person. And I hate waking up. It's horrible. But I think snoozing is our worst, like, enemy. Because you're so much more tired. Like, sometimes when I wake up at my intended um, time, in the morning, I always think, like, I don't need that much time to get ready. So I'll just keep sleeping. But then after you snooze about three times, you are so much more tired. Because usually at my... Like intended wake up time at the first alarm. I'm like, okay, I could wake up, but I still can't. So, Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a fun struggle. no, it's not fun. That's the worst. Yeah, it's a good one though. Like, I'm bad at being on time, like in general. And I'm bad at not procrastinating. Like, I, I have the compulsion to wait to do everything in the last minute. Like, I don't know, maybe it thrills me or something. I don't know. You know what? Same. Like the thrill. <laughs> I know I'm gonna like for sure. I'll be. I'll say you know like yeah. I'm gonna have this interview out by Monday, and it'll be like Sunday night. I am like quickly trying to edit this as fast as possible. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do the same, definitely. that that'll be like my game plan strategy. I'm like yeah, no, I have it totally fine. I, I think It's it's weird. it's 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 a weird thrill. You know you're gonna do Yeah. it like. Um, we'll do one last one, and that is um, describe your perfect day. My perfect day, my perfect day. Um, I want this game. It's hard questions. Like, I'll I'll give it to you afterwards. There's like yes, I got two different thank you. sets of games. Okay, my perfect day. That's so hard though, because is it like my perfect, 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 blissful, amazing day? Or is it just like a great day in the life I'm living currently? say the the absolute perfect day The absolute perfect day? Or not? mm -hmm. um you know what give me both how about that Okay. Yes, that's a good one. So, a good day for me in my current living situation. I think I would sleep in, then have really good, like, egg, eggs Norwegian breakfast with iced coffee and a little cigarette. Um, then... 
I would go to the spa. I would get a massage and go in a sauna. Um, then I would go shopping and buy a whole new wardrobe. And then I would go to the studio and finish five songs in an hour. And then in the evening, I would go and have like a huge lobster dinner with my friends. And then go to a karaoke bar, maybe. And well, I'm really explaining it. It's like a normal day. <laughs> yes. A normal and you know day. what? That's it's that's normal. how you manifest that. Just yeah. talk about it as if it's the present thing, the present day. Yeah. Then go to a karaoke bar and then like maybe play in the Ziggo Dome, have a sold out show. And then. go to bed have fresh sheets and have a really nice dream and then yeah that would be a good day <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good day but although that's actually close to my perfect day except it excludes like traveling to a foreign location i mean there's lots of versions of a perfect day i have to say i don't know i could i would also be happy just walking through like Hawaii, like I have a really nice nature hike, climb a volcano, maybe bungee jump, go scuba diving. Like there's lots of variations of a perfect as you, day. As long as you're not bungee jumping into the volcano. Okay, I'll keep that, <laughs> keep that in mind. Well, unless it's unactive, right? Then I can jump. Yes. Yeah. I think so. There's not that many yeah. that are un inactive right now that can, you can do that. No. I mean, no, probably I won't find myself in a situation where I want to do that. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I really like um, city life, but I also really like adventurous nature activities. Yeah. So there's many variations. Lovely. Maybe add scuba diving to that, to my previous depiction of a good day. All right. I don't know how you're going to fit that into your schedule yeah, before know the karaoke or after. <laughs> maybe, maybe before, because before. with karaoke, I would get drunk and okay. then it's not good to go scuba drive, diving, scuba driving, <laughs> scuba diving drunk. Yeah. So probably before. I love that. Yes. And you know what? Um, hopefully now that you have it out in the universe, Will happen. This will happen. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what did I do? I woke up. I had eggs Norwegian. Then I went to the sauna and spa. Then I went shopping. I bought a whole new wardrobe. Then I went to the studio and recorded five songs. Then I had a lobster dinner. Then I went to karaoke. Then I went scuba diving. And after that, I sold out Ziggo Dome. I think that's, I think that's a pretty good day. Sounds yeah. like a fantastic day. Yeah. And we'll, we will see that soon. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you'll have to give me the replay on everything. Yeah, I will make a vlog. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, you know, your album's out now. Um, I'm always curious, are we plan Are you going to do any kind of uh, mini touring around Europe? No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Like, I am, I am really bad at like acquiring gigs uh yeah i'm i'm very nervous so that's one big thing but i'm also very busy like i work full time and i go to the studio to try to make new stuff but whenever like a rest kind of sets into my mind i think i will do like a like an like i guess i will just no this is something like i'm really horrible at i need to find a way to get more shows because that's eventually what I want to be doing but this is one of those things where I think like just do it like just write an email and send it to all venues in the Netherlands but somehow I, I'm not doing it but I know that's what I need to do so yeah to be continued, <laughs> to be continued. To be continued. I love that so with that being said while we're waiting to be continued um where can we be able to find you? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, sorry, um, where can we be able to find you on socials? 
everything at Elif Dame, E L I F D A M E. And for any bookers out there, book me because I'm, I have a great live show. <laughs>